So today we want to talk more about pumps and basically pumps are part of turbo machinery. So that is a very generic term uh, and the turbo machinery covers more than just pumps but uh, it covers fans, it covers hydraulic turbines, steam turbines, etc. But a lot of the uh, equations and things that we'll do apply to pumps and fans and a lot of rotating machinery. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to get Euler's equation. Euler equation. So what is Euler's equation or how do you get it? Well, you have the I region of a rotating impeller and then you have the exit region of the rotating impeller and that's a poor rendition and we have blades that are in the rotating impeller and I show a few right there, right? All right, let me show one that's kind of going straight up or where <laughs> close to straight up. So it's really hard to show it completely. But if I do a radius straight line out and then a straight line out for the, the, the two ends of the blade, the beginning and the end of the blade of the impeller, okay? Then I have basically the radial direction defined on the exit and the radial direction defined on the inlet as well as I can do the tangential, true, the tangential, the tangential. So we have flow uh, coming in. Uh, you introduce a control volume which has the boundary for the inlet where the fluid's crossing in, in the eye, and then the exit way out here. That's a kind of a, what do you call that, donut control volume. So where is it coming in? In the eye. Where is it going out? Out there, radially out. Well, it's not just radially, there's a tangential component to it as well. You do a conservation or a balance of not linear momentum, because this is a rotating system, it's rotating with angle omega. You do a balance on angular momentum, right? So angular momentum. And we have one thing that's going to change the flow's angular momentum as it goes in and out of this control volume. It's called the, the shaft torque applied to it to keep the impeller rotating at a constant speed. Otherwise, it's not going to continue to rotate at a constant speed. And so you can work out that the shaft torque is equal to rho Q. All right, help me a little bit. Remind me, rho is density. Q, volumetric flow rate. The product of the volumetric flow rate and rho is mass flow rate. So sometimes you'll see m dot. But let's leave rho Q. And then we're going to have R2 times something minus R1 times something. What do you think the R1 and the R2 are? The radius at the inlet and then the radius at the exit. So if somebody says I have a, a particle, here's a, a, the origin of a coordinate system. The coordinate system goes like this. Maybe I'd start it and just leave it 2D. And I have a particle over here and it's flaming along with speed V right there. Okay, somebody says calculate its uh, angular momentum around the or about the point origin, the, the origin right here, this point O. Can you do that? What is, what is its linear momentum? That's another question. And then what is that object's uh, angular momentum about that point O? I'm going to pause. I'm going to make you walk. I'm going to walk around and see what you do with that. All right, so uh, if you chose a symbol for linear momentum, what would be the symbol for linear momentum? L. L, sometimes I've seen L. How about symbol for angular momentum? H. H, 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 H is a preferred one. Now, I put a little notation on top of the L and top of the H. What does that indicate? It's really, these are vector entities. Linear momentum, I know we can do one dimensional in the X and so we're restrained to 1D, but you could do it in two dimensions, you could do it in three dimensions. So in general, we could talk about a mass 
of ob um, an object of mass m having a, a instantaneous velocity vector v. Uh, it's at that point right then and there. And uh, we could uh, say in this system the linear momentum is, what is it equal to? And then what is the angular momentum equal to? I'm, I'm going to pause and I'm going to walk around again and do this. All right, uh, the linear momentum was really needed for a particular equation. Uh, it was used in this equation, the sum of somethings equal to the time rate of change of, I mean, I'm butchering up probably not the way you saw it, but something can change the linear momentum of an object. So what can change the linear momentum of an object? The imbalance of forces acting on the object. True? And then what could happen if there's an imbalance of forces acting on the object? Its linear momentum could decrease or increase, go up or go down. It could be changed. True? All right, let me ask you this. I should have even gotten rid of this insert completely new page. Sorry. Uh, I didn't think this would be so challenging. Uh, here is a particle. And it's at, it, at this time, T1, and it's at that velocity, V1. And the same particle is there at a different time, T2, and it's now going at this velocity, V2. Can you see that at some different time, the object has a different velocity? It's not only the magnitude, but it's the orientation. It's changed, true? So... How could that ever happen? Application of some imbalance of forces. So if I would have said along the trajectory, let's say that this trajectory of this particle did something like that. If I said the average application of force to make this object change its direction, is, and that's related to its linear momentum, uh, would it be more that the F as an average would be applied in that direction, 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 that direction? Which direction is, is F being applied to make it change from to being more downward directed? And maybe I should do this, maybe I should do this too. Make it clear that the length of the vector is indication of its speed. So what about the length of that vector V2? Has I shown it? Is it going slower or faster at, at time 2? It's going faster. And it used to be more horizontal and a little downward component. Now it has a huge downward component and very little horizontal component. True? So what do you think? What, what F, which, you know, the, I'm just trying to show in the red the average force applied during that time interval? It would be down, that's right, so rule all of these out. Down to the center? Depends. You have to really decompose this vector, this part and that part, and then you have to decompose this vector, this part and that part. What about the x component of the vector? has to be negative. See, it's, it's going to be slightly down. I'll get rid of this, sorry. Wouldn't that be le like it? But it's going to be more, because of the change in the vector, it's going to be more down and just a little bit to the backward direction. I'm you know, just talking in the negative x. Negative y, a little bit in the negative x. True? Wouldn't that be like, so you can take this great equation, the sum of the forces equal to uh, time rate of change of uh, mv. Is that really an equation? Do we ever see an equation like this? Whose equation? Newton's second. And then we have uh, the f dt, the change in the MV, and then we can do this. And what is this term called? Mm -hmm. 
Impulse. Impulse. That's right. Force integrated over time gives you an impulse. And when you integrate over time, what does it result in? Changes the linear momentum of the system. Impulse changes the linear momentum of the system. True or false? True. True. Now we must want to do it for an angular system. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy. We uh, didn't do so well on the linear system. What says we're going to do better on the angular? <laughs> but what would be the analogy for uh, this equation for an angular system? Not a sum of forces. You put the big M. I think there was not too many other big M's. Why did she put a big M on it? Instead of force, it's just the application of moments of forces. So sum of M's, is that a vector entity in general? Moments? Moments of a force? Yeah. Equal to time rate of change of, not linear momentum, I could have written this as but a change of angular momentum. Time rate of change angular momentum. True? How do I break this down to make it easier to digest? Um, easy one would be I just have a flywheel. It's all a so it, uh, you know, solid disk. It's rotating about this point right here with the omega. Right? And I see a lot of people were writing I's down. I. Right? And so they would say something like uh, I omega. Okay, what is the omega? Rotational speed. What is the I? Mass moment of inertia. Cap I. There's even a parallel axis theorem to help you get the eyes when you want to shoot it away from the cent center of mass or centroid of the object, right? So, uh, so sometimes you'll do this. You'll say for a system like that, I sum the moments to change the what? The, the rotational speed because I typically doesn't change of a big wheel. It's, it's just spinning up, so the mass moment of inertia doesn't, is constant about that axis, and now it's just changing its rotational speed. Hopefully, some people were writing I's and omegas and all that, and say, yeah, I was close, but now I want a particle. It's not rotating exactly. You could even do the same particle we just did right here. We talked about its linear momentum at time one and time two, but does it have an instantaneous angular momentum about the origin at time one? Yeah? And so what is the equation for not cap L, but cap H? You're about, you're about the one that got it, I think. So R cross V M. Let me pause, walk around, and see if you agree. Is this it? Is this good? I'm going to pause, walk around, and want you to finish it out. So I guess most of you are agreeing that it's R cross V is the right representation. True? Okay. Um, let me do this. Uh, for this particle right here, this is the origin of the coordinate system. Would that be R at time one? All right. If I take R cross V... Tell me, is it in the, we have a right-handed coordinate system, right? Is this the positive direction of Z, positive X, positive Y? Is that the correct positive direction of Z? Yes? So what about at time one, is R1 cross V1 positive or negative? Is it in the positive Z or the negative Z? Negative. Negative, isn't it? That's right, so it's negative. And then we come over here, it's still in the negative, R2 cross V2. True? All right. Um, so we have the time rate of change of that. And what, is we, what do we have here? Sometimes we just put like 1F instead of the sum of the forces. 
Sometimes we'll put M for moments. Sometimes we'll just put tau for torques or cap T for torques, some shaft torque, something, because that's something like that. All right, cap M. It's moments. I asked this question, uh, is uh, V cross R correct? No. It's off by a negative sign. True? True. All right. <sighs> hmm. I got to go back here. So uh, what do we have here is, is I have, oh yeah, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to now write it in scalar form because we know that both of those are in the k direction and they're negative, right? But what is r cross v at time one written scalar? So this is r one cross v one. It's equal to something just in the k. So I'm not worried about the k anymore. We even know it's in the negative, but what's, what's the body right here? What's, what's in the formula? I'm going to pause. Let's continue on. So let me, let me uh, <coughs> say that you could set up a matrix where you have I, J, K, and then you have R1 in the X, R1 uh, in the Y, 0. There's no K component of R1. And then you have the V1, X, and the V1, Y, 0. So then when you do, you would get just uh, the R1x, R1x times V1y minus the uh, R1y times V1x. Uh, True or false? So something like that, that that I'm looking for. And if you said, well, what is the, the relationship? You can work it out a little bit. It's like you decompose this V1 into uh, V1x v1x and then if you multiply that by this distance that goes up to there isn't that r1y r1y it's like perpendicular distance to the line of application for that component of the vector and then then you get this one coming down that'll be v1y coming down it and, and, and it's times this distance right here because the line of application goes down, and it's, uh, what is that distance? R1 times some sort of decompose it, right? You get the R1x, the x component, R1. All right, well, maybe you don't like the scalar application to it. But what I want to do after I do that is then we see that you have a distance times... You, at this point right here, you can de decompose the velocity coming off of the tips into two components. You can de decompose it into the direction that is in the radial direction. And you can decompose it into the, I'm sorry, the radial is going straight out, the tangential direction to tangential, and then the radial direction or the normal direction. Okay? Does this component, component of the velocity, its line of action goes straight through the origin. So even if this V2n, uh, that's the notation, here's V2, the velocity at the exit that's coming out. Normal, this is the normal right here. If even if V2n is a big number, the, does it have any angular momentum taking with it. No, the angular momentum of the outflow is due to V2 tangential. And it's the V2 tangential times R2 that gives me the right uh, R cross V. Right? And then, how about down here? Well, you decompose to the V1 normal and the V1 tangential and it's v1 tangential so first time you look at this equation you go what what no no it's pretty straightforward so that gives us the equation for the torque that's applied to continue to rotate that uh, impeller at constant speed omega where it's changing the 
angular momentum of the inflow to the outflow. Okay. Well, let's say somebody wanted to calculate the brake horse power. Well, what's the brake horse power? It'd be the shaft torque times the rotational speed omega. True or false? Do you like that? Is that true? So that would be the, the ro uh, you could put a rho uh, Q omega times this R2 V2 tangential minus R1 V1 tangential. The, the product of omega times R2 is the tips, um, not radial, but it's it, the tips bl blade velocity. Let me tr try that. And often they'll substitute and they'll put U1 is equal to omega R1 and U2 is equal to omega R2. These are the blade, I can spell blade, come on, give me another chance, B-L-A-D-E, tip velocities or speeds because we know it's direction. It's always, you know, going in a circle. The tip of the impeller blade at the beginning and the tip other end, the other tip, right? So the inlet tip and the outlet tip or the exit tip. Okay, so what you can do is you can rewrite this equation as rho q times a cap u2 v2 t minus cap u1 v1 t. So you'll see that written that way. What is cap u again? Blade tip velocity. All right, or impeller tip velocities. The brake horsepower can also be calculated not just from torque and rotational speed, but it can be calculated from flow con considerations, true? So we could calculate it as uh, the product of the pressure gain times the volumetric flow rate through the system, true? We could also do it as a head, energy head times the mass flow rate or the elevation head uh, gravimetric flow rate, the, the weight flow rate, which would be uh, G times M dot. Or rho QG. I have an equation for the brake horsepower. I can now get an equation for the head gain. Do uh, you want to write it in cap H? Cap H? So that would be the elevation, not elevation, the uh, energy head gain is equal to um, cap U times V2T minus cap U1 V1T. You could write it a number of different ways, but there's a very compact way of writing it. All right. One last thing is most of the time the flow that comes into a pump, you kind of get a, go back and visualize a pump. It comes into the eye, it does a 90 degree turn, then it's thrown out the ends of the impeller, right? All right, so what about V1T? Is it huge or small for a typical uh, pipe uh, pump where the flow comes in radially and then it turns and 90 goes out? It's negligible. So guess what? often equal to zero. So you get a very simple equation that says the head gain is equal to U2, the exit tip uh, velocity of the impeller times V2T, V2T. We know the direction of V2T is the same, V2T is the same direction as U2, but they're not the same magnitude. One is the actual fluid velocity and the other is just the blade tip velocity. All right. So let me continue on. So what we can do is we have uh, a, a blow up of that um, 
that diagram. I'm just going to kind of show it like this. And what do we have? We have radio going out. What do we have here? This is the direction U2. But the velocity at that point is not the same. It's in the same direction. But that's the velocity of 2 tangential. But the fluid's going to come off in a generic V2. And you can decompose V2 into the two components, V2 normal and V2 tangential. That's pretty straightforward. Our tip, I mean our blade, is curved. And I'm going to show a backward curved right here. And at that point right here, this is the inlet eye. You could do the same thing. But what we're going to do is we're going to take and extrapolate this curvature right here, straight line back, and this is an angle beta. This is an angle beta 2 because it's the angle uh, going out at exit 2. If you come right here, you extrapolate this one this way. That's the angle beta 1, or you could put it over here, put it beta 1. So you don't have to have beta 1 equal to 0 and, and beta 2 equal to 0 either. We're going to actually vary beta 2 from negative to 0 to positive. We'll talk about backward uh, facing uh, or a radial blade or a forward tipped blade on an impeller for both moving water pumps as well as fans moving uh, air. All right. So there's a little bit of geometry here. So COT of beta 2. I don't even remember what COT is. Cotangent. Oh boy. So the cotangent can be expressed as cap U2 minus V2 tangential divided by VR2. I'm going to say it's a little trigonometry in your vectors. And I'm going to just take that for granted. What you could do is you can rewrite this equation. You rewrite it in the form of V2 tangential is equal to U2 minus the cotangent. Ah, see, I want to write cosine, don't I? The cotangent of the exit angle tip beta 2 times V2R. Uh, Why did I switch? I should try to keep those in the right order, right? V2R and V2 tangential. All right. Now, there's another relationship that deals with the flow rate. Flow rate. And it's hard to show, but in the third dimension, we have B2, which is the thickness. I think I showed an impeller, an encased impeller, and it could have a large B1, and then as it goes out, it tapers and has a smaller B2. But that's that thickness or width at the end, B2. So what is the flow rate Q related to? Well, it's related to 2 pi R2 circumference at the radius times B2. Doesn't that give me the area? Times V2 radial. And I should use not radial, normal. If I'm going to use it, I'm using normal and radial. This is getting mixed up. V2 radial or V2 normal. Uh, I'll stay with radial since I already wrote it right here and right there. So you have V2. You can decompose it into the tangential as well as the radial direction. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question about the V. So the, are they an average or it, does it matter that? Yes, they're an average. They're an average. It's, we're doing a one-dimensional analysis of what comes off. You're right. And so if you really looked at an instant in time uh, over that gap between the, the end of one t uh, impeller blade and the other one, it's not a linear profile of velocity going out. But we're assuming it is. Treating it, making a very simple calculation to get a simple result. So you can get an expression for V2R is equal to the flow rate, Q divided by 2 pi R2 V2. 
Well, you could take that expression and substitute it into right here. True? And so what do we have? We're going to have that V2, uh, uh, actually don't want to substitute it there. What I wanted to do was go back to this equation that I ended right here for the head. What do we have for the head? Head is equal to U2 times um, V2 tangential, right? So V2 tangential goes into there. So we get U2 times U2 minus cotangent of beta 2 V2R but we substitute also for that, and you pick up Q divided by 2 pi R2B2. Okay, this may not seem all that shocking, but here you go. The head, in general, is equal to U2 squared minus U2 times the cotangent of the angle exiting times the flow rate volumetric flow rate divided by 2 pi R2B2. So that it shows us the general form, that the head is equal to, let's say, a constant 1 minus a constant 2 times the flow rate for a pump, just from the, the consideration of the trigonometric relations of flow and velocities. Okay. But how can this K2 change? Well, what about the, the cotangent of beta 1? I mean, sorry, beta 2. It changes. The sign can change. Um, who has a calculator? They can remind us. What is the cotangent of the angle 0? What is it? Zero. It, it, I think it's zero. Is it? So. So isn't the cotangent, the cotangent when beta two is equal to zero is equal to zero? Give me a thumbs up if you agree. All right. And how about the cotangent when beta 2 is less than 0, some negative amount? What happens there? Cotangent of a negative angle? Who has a calculator? You're going to verify that or just remember it. You're doing it the good way, right? Just saying, I can remember the definition of... All right, here, let me get to a new slide. What is the cotangent defined as? Cotangent of alpha or beta, leave it beta. Sine of, hold it, is, what is tangent? Sine over cosine, right? So it's cosine over sine, isn't it? Okay, so cosine of beta divided by sine of beta. So what about for beta less than zero, for negative? What about the cosine of a negative angle? Is that positive or negative? Well, isn't the cosine positive? The, the cosine's positive, but the sine is negative, which gives it a negative. So the cotangent is negative. This cotangent of beta is negative. And then if beta is greater than zero, it's just a little bit, you know, we're not going past 90 degrees, then it's positive, then this cotangent. So what we have is go back to, this is the inlet, bad looking inlet, there's the exit, and you can have blades that are, that are go like this, and when you draw the radial going out, that is a negative, negative beta. This is backward. Uh, tip, uh, exit tip, and then this, this cotangent is negative. You could also have another impeller. We're really focused on the outlet. 
where you go straight out like this and the blade is actually just like that and then what is beta in this case this was beta less than zero this is beta equal to zero it's a radial radial tip now you don't have to have it radial the whole way out but the easiest radial tip is if it's radial on inlet and radial on outlet it's just straight blade and then the other one is like this and let's draw the line straight out and you could actually have like that and it goes like this and now beta is positive and this is forward tipped all right most water pumps what do you think they are backward tipped okay um, anybody taking a really little cheap water pump apart maybe with an aquarium system or anything like that taking it apart yeah. and what do you see for the blades they're flat. They're flat. That's the middle case. You can go to Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, and go to whoever sells these little cheapies. I mean, really, really cheap. Buy an itty bitty, take it apart, and look at it. And it's like, hey, this blade is just straight out. And some of them are so cheap, they really don't have, the way they have the inlet and outlet, the motor could run backwards or forwards. I've seen that, and it doesn't matter. It'll always pressurize to the one side that it needs to pressurize, the outside, where it catches it. There's really some cheap pumps. And, and, okay, how many people ever looked at a car and they had the uh, blower motor? They had to replace the blower motor for their heater and, or air conditioning system in the car. I know this is air now, right? You had to, right? I had to. Anybody? You ever looked at it? You got the motor in there, but then what do you have on the outside? What does it look like? It's forward tipped. It's a very little ring of curved blades, and there's a, usually a lot of them. And the radius R1 and R2 is not much different in the blower motor. How many people, give me a thumbs up if you know what I'm talking about. All right, you need to pull apart more cars. <laughs> or pull apart stuff, right? Just take it apart. Don't throw it away. Take it apart, then throw it away. Look at it. All right, so this, this brings up a, an interesting characteristic that as a function of the head, as a function of the flow rate, and you have three lines. It says here's the H1, and it's radial. It just goes flat out. It's straight because the cotangent of beta is zero, that whole K2 is zero, or it's straight sloped downward, what would that would be for the backward? That's when the beta on the exit, all these are exit, beta, exit, beta, exit, beta, is less than zero. But guess what? For the forward, the head goes up. Now you combine that with the head from this diagram where it's a K1 plus a K2 Q squared. Oops, not Q squared, Q, sorry. And that changes sign, right, depending on if it's backward or forward, if it's radial, that K2 is zero. And you combine it with the brake horsepower, the brake horsepower needed to drive that fluid mover. Okay, well, how do I calculate the brake horsepower? It's that head times some flow rate. What is our flow rate? Don't go to sleep on me. What, flow, what do I multiply? This is simple. Rho Q, M dot. We're using head as our energy head, okay? So if I do that, how does this, this I just substitute in here, I get a constant one times uh, uh, rho Q, and then I have this constant two rho, ah, rho Q squared. How does that vary? So if I plotted the brake horse power as a function of flow rate, what happens if it's zero flow? It's always zero. But if K2 is zero, then it just goes up linearly with Q. What would that wouldn't be for? The radial. But if, K, if, if beta 2 is negative, backward faced, 
then the K2 is negative, and you're going to get coming, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it'll be coming down like that. What is that? That's our backward. And what about the other one? Forward. Okay, so what happens here is it's an observation of why a lot of pumps are backward facing because as your flow goes up, your power doesn't go up, 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 and why they're not really forward facing because here it would put, if you, in old school, you just had a motor, you threw it on, you turned it on, and it ran. That motor is going to want to try to run at a particular RPM. It's going to try to want to cut and slice and bring out this flow. But if you put an undersized motor on it uh, for, for, the, for the backward face, it would just slow down a little bit. It wouldn't burn out as much. It, for the forward face, it would be burned out. So it's less stable for a forward face if you're doing water. But what's the benefit of it? The forward face is going to give you a higher H, isn't it? Isn't this a higher H, higher head? So it's going to boost that head. In an air system, when you have a blower motor, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> and so it's curved forward, and you just want that flow. It pretty much gives you a decent flow with a pretty good head. Okay, I'm doing a pretty poor job of explaining why water pumps or have impellers that are backward face. Really cheap pumps are just straight out radial. <laughs> and some uh, ones that really need to deliver super high head will be curved forward, but they're a little risky for water, but they're okay for the air. Make sense? All right. So if you put together uh, the backward here is the head as a function of flow, Q. It's going down. All right. What about the forward? It's, it's not really trying to go down. It's trying to go up. It's trying to go up, but then it's going to break over, and it's you know, going to not, it's not going to work as great. It's going to have a, it's not going to be able to throw that out. So that's the general profile of the head for the forward facing in a blade versus the backward forward all right what about the power the brake horse power is going to go up and then back down brake horse power what about the brake horse power here and so we don't like that so it could be very high brake horse power if you could burn out your motor what about the radio well it's in between so let's just put it in between so it's more flat and then eventually a little bit of a hump and then down and the brake horse power is not as strongly going up but more gradual growing up flatter but it still goes up all right okay what time do i have to stop i got about 15 minutes so did we talk about the system curve we already talked about the pump curves true and now even the shape of the impeller you can tell the characteristics of the uh, pump curve, but now we're going to talk about a system curve. There's two types of systems you really need to be good at, closed and open. For a closed system, I have some device and I need to move water over to it. So I take and I have a pump right here and we bring it over and we throw it out and it puts in a loop like that. And you could have multiple devices like this, right? And maybe this elevation change from here to here is significant, but it's a closed system, right? Somebody says, I want you to get the head loss, which is from the outlet of the pipe pump to the inlet of the pump. That whole side, that whole loop, isn't that our head loss, our cap H, L, or, or pressure loss, or pressure drop? And that has to be balanced by what goes across the pump. There's a pump gain for the pump and a, a loss for the system. So somebody says, I want you to forget about the pump characteristics in the blue. Uh, let's call it H gain or something. Let's, call, let's talk about the loss. Let's talk about the head loss. Well, we know how to model that, pumping systems, right? Be like some F, L over D, one, um, half uh, v squared 
plus what else? Sum of some loss coefficients. If I start changing valve positions, K could go up if I close the valve or down, or if I have elbows and T's and other things, times so one half V squared. Does this look all good? So if I multiply this whole equation by A squared over A squared, what is A? The, the cross-sectional area of my pipe that I'm throwing the fluid through. Then what happens is I get an equation where this is some F L over D, sum of the K's. That's a plus, sum of the K's. Bunch of K's there. Uh, times uh, one half uh, A squared Q squared. What? Q. It's proportional to my volumetric flow rate squared. It, that's my head loss. So if somebody says, I want you to plot the curve, y is equal to uh, ax squared, what does that look like on an xy plot? Well, I'm doing the same thing here. Plot the head loss as a function of the flow. What does that look like? Parabolic. It's parabolic. Where does it go to zero? Does it go to zero always at the origin? Look at our curve again. It's just all of this is a constant times Q squared. It will always go through zero, zero. It will, this is one of the takeaways for a closed system. It will always go through zero, zero on this head loss versus flow. And does it go up flat like that? Or does it go down like that? Or does it go up like that? It's quadratic positive curved upwards, isn't it? Now, it could be like this, or it could be like this. What is changing between system A, B, and C? The value, the value of how long the pipes are, the friction factor in the pipes, whether or not I have a large K because I'm closing some valve. So think about the, the K is going up as, as there. That's easiest to me is I'm closing a valve. But it doesn't change shape, and it doesn't change where it goes through the origin. One of the things that people will do is say, oh, I have a high-rise building, and I have a pump down here, and there's my supply, and I need to bleed off some and put it through this and then take it out and then bring it back down. To, but then i got to go up higher, and i got to put it through here. Then I put it then down here. Oh, i got to go over here. i got up here. You know what? This building is so tall that uh, what I need to do is I need to size this pump so that the head gain across that pump can match the elevation gain that the, the system needs to provide. And so they'll say, well, you know, I figure out that I only need, uh, each one of these is, is, is balanced, so it's only 50 PSI, 50 PSI, 50 PSI, 50 PSI. But I need to, to move it from here to here, and maybe that's, I don't know, 30 PSI. Well, I need a pump to supply both to push it through the resistance plus to push it up in elevation. Is that good logic or bad logic? It's bad logic for a closed system because, yeah, you're pushing it up on this side, but what's coming down there? <laughs> and so for a closed system, there is no equ in the equation for the head loss. There is no delta Z. There is no delta Z. Guess what about for the no open system? I got to go to another page. So, but I see that where they say, oh no, we need a bigger motor and a bigger pump because you know it's got to go up that high in the building. Okay. Let's go down to the open system. So we have an open system. You have a tank filled with some fluid. The goal is to move it to another tank and fill that fluid, transfer. So we put a piping system. I'll take it out of the bottom. I'll put it through a pump. I'll have some zigzags to avoid some equipment. And then here, quick one. Should I put it in at the bottom or should I take it out to the top and then spray it out? Put it out to the top. Why? It'll cost a little more to put it out the top. But why would I put it out the top? the same reason attorneys don't like engineers in jury duty. 
Because we don't only think about how it could work or did work. We always think about what if. So what would happen if I just pumped a bunch of this fluid up here and then something happened where the pump, do uh, you think there's a tendency for that fluid to want to flow back? You bet. And that would be unwanted. So typically put it in and dump it off. You ever see the trucks and they're filling up on the side of the road? They put the, the hose and it's up at the top and it's spewing in. And visually you can tell it's like, otherwise if you have a break in the system, the saws does not want that water to be sucked back through that fire hydrant into the system and then you drink it somewhere else. Eh -eh. They want it out and then it becomes somebody else's. Here's a quick story. A guy was uh, working in a system and he had to pump water uphill from one tank to another tank. This is in California a long time ago. And he laid all this pipe and then it was all empty. But he had the pump. It's empty of water. It's full of air. He had the pump right here. So one day he starts it up. Did I tell you this story? Stop me if I did. Sorry. It's a true story. So the water starts flowing. What happens? Think about this. What happens to the air that was fully filling that pipe before he started the pump? It gets pushed back. Where does the air finally go? It's getting pushed, get rid of this red line. The water is filling up the pipe, true? After a couple of seconds, out come bubbling on the bottom of that top tank, the water. And the guy goes, this is great. And it was late in the day, so he just pumped it for a couple hours. And the way he was pumping it, he had a big diesel or gasoline engine running a centrifugal pump. But then he said, I got to go home. So he took and he closed the valve, which was very smart, shut it off, closed the valve, and went home and said, this is the level that I need it. Um, that's where it's at today, but I'm going to need that level up to this far. I'll pump the rest tomorrow. So he goes back tomorrow. Starts up the engine, the engine runs, I don't know, 3,000 RPM, 600 RPM, whatever it was running at. They like to run at constant RPM, right? It's hooked up, op gets it running, opens this valve, and he doesn't hardly have any flow rate. And now, this is the typical, this is what I would have done too. It says, huh, it's not flowing like it did yesterday. It was flowing great yesterday, but now it's not even flowing what's wrong I know what I'll do take the throttle on that engine and what's he do he takes that RPM the speed either Omega or N is used for engineering for that RPM to spin it up faster we're gonna cover it I wanted to get to it today sorry I'll get to it in the tomorrow but let me finish the story so as he spins it up if you had a pressure gauge right here on the outlet to that pump, what do you think the pressure at the outlet to the pump is going to do if you start making it go a lot faster? Not only a little bit, it goes up quadratic. That's what I needed to get to today, but I didn't get to it. Okay? So guess what happened to his pipe? It burst. And where did it burst? Where the pressure was highest. Where did it first just on the outlet of the pump. Now he has all this fluid that was up there built from yesterday. He has a burst pipe. He just can't close the valve very easily. It's burst. And where does all this water go? And it's a big disaster. So always dump high. <laughs> and when you start up a system, there's a lot of inertia in that system and it takes a while to start getting that water to finally get flowing again. All right. Well, we'll pick up there next time. Thank you.